Welcome to the No Rain, No Rainbows podcast. This is a show about pushing through obstacles and hard times in order to live a happy and fulfilled life. I'm your host, Ted Baton, and it's a pleasure to have you joining us. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Let's grow. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the No Rain, No Rainbows podcast. So glad you're joining us. I'm your host, Ted Fate, and as always, I have my executive producer, Andre Settles, with me, but not on the episode right now. He's putting this together. But as we continue to record these episodes on Zoom, we are lucky enough to get outside of the borders of South Carolina. We're going from the East Coast to the West Coast. My man, John Shore, joining us from the West Coast. How you doing, big guy? Hey, doing great here from sunny Los Angeles. Great to see you, bud. How's the weather? It is beautiful today. Uh, no clouds, probably like 76 degrees outside. You're the weatherman, so <laughs> I, don't, I feel weird telling you what the weather is. But um, yeah, yeah it's, been, it's been a beautiful week. Yeah, I love it, man. Um, I definitely still have to make it out that, that far to see you. I haven't been that far west yet. But uh, we go way back for the listeners who, who don't know, know John. John and I went to college together. And uh, since, since we've both left college, I've seen John's career really kind of take shape and blow up. So um, really quick for the listeners who don't know who you are, aren't lucky enough to have the introduction yet. Why not really quick let them know who you are and, and what it is you do, man? Uh, John Shower, rep in Rockland County, New York, 845. What's good? Um, living in uh, downtown Los Angeles. I've been in LA for about 10 years now. I am a uh, photographer, director, cinematographer, uh, editor, mm. creative director, whatever, uh, whatever it calls for that day. But I help people go from their concept to content is what uh, I help with. What I love that. I love that, man. And got to wear a lot of hats. And I want to unpack a lot of that along the way um, in terms of how, how you got to where you are. Because I remember your journey started off, man, with um, just going out west and, and <laughs> crashing on a couch, you know. <laughs> so I guess let's start the story for the listeners. You graduate college. You went out to L.A. Um, what was your plan when you went out there? What were you thinking of doing? So the plan was just to be there on vacation, visit my brother, come back to New York and start grad school to be a guidance counselor. Um, growing up, I was playing music, taking photos, artistic stuff. And my parents kind of were like, we'd be willing to pay for your school, but you have to do something that's going to return our investment. So you're not, we're not paying for art school. We're not paying for music school. We want you to do something, quote unquote, real. And uh, so I did that and continued to like shoot photos and play music through school. And then I graduated and I said, I'm going to go spend the summer out on the West Coast visiting my brother. During that time, he was playing in a band in L.A. So I was going out to like Sunset Strip every night, taking photos of other bands and people I was meeting and sending photos around and meeting really, really incredible people who moved to Los Angeles to chase their dreams. You know, directors, photographers, musicians. And by the end of the summer, you know, I was supposed to go back and I was getting hit up for jobs. And, and mostly I was just really inspired by the people who were there chasing their dreams. And I'm like, what am I doing? Like going back to New York to start a job I don't even really want to do so I can maybe one day afford to do the things that I enjoy. Forget it. So I just stayed. I decided to stay and ride it out and see what happens. Yeah. And it's been 10 years. Yeah, and that's, and that's what's awesome, man, because I think a lot of people end up landing in, in the same kind of routine that you were going down. I love the fact that mm -hmm. you had the awareness where you're like, oh, snap, um, why go back? Um, what was it like when you first started getting surrounded by people that were chasing dreams? Because I feel like in college, we had fun, but we were, we were all kind of going through our major, and then we graduated, and we're like, okay, we're going to you know, get a job and, and try this, try that. I mean you're out in LA and you have people who are automatically out there for a reason. They have bigger dreams. Kind of what does that do to your mindset? It kind of just showed me that it's possible. Like growing up in like the suburb that I did and, you know, going to school up in Albany, it's not like you meet people who are like, Oh, I moved to Albany to like be a writer or like anything like that. It's like, Oh, I'm doing real estate. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. You know, so I get there and 
in my head, I always wanted to direct music videos. Like I used to watch music videos as a kid and be like, I want to come up with these ideas and, and shoot these things. But, you know, in my town, it's like, how do you do that? So when I get out to here to LA and I meet these guys who are like, oh, I got to shoot this weekend. And I'm like, what? A shoot? <laughs> like, what? That sounds amazing. Like, can I come? Can I see what you're doing? Like, can I just be there? And like, I would go and just see like, it was just adults playing around, like playing with cameras and being like, this looks sick. This looks sick. And I'm like, that's really all it takes. I could do this, I think, you know? And yeah, it, it was just getting a, a view into it and knowing that it's possible. Yeah. And sometimes I, I always tell people, I'm like, listen, man, if you crack that door, I'm running in it. Like I'm, I'm all the way in. Don't give me an inch. I'm taking it all. So <laughs> going straight Kool-Aid on that thing, just <laughs> yeah. blasted through the wall. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm going Kool-Aid on this thing. Yeah. yeah. And you're in the and building. Then, so, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and then once, and, and, and to go back a little bit, when I was looking at school, like to go to college and I was looking up like, maybe working in a recording studio, like what is that? Or, or doing audio and, and you see like, there's sound design and audio production and audio engineering. And there's all these kind of siloed, it just felt very siloed. So then once you get there and you see it's like, oh no, I just taught myself how to do everything. And this audio guy is like designing sound and mixing the sound and all these things. And you realize like, there's, the structure can be broken. The plans can be broken. It's just like dive in, get obsessed with it, learn as much as you can and just do it. Yeah. And that's like 60% of it. I would say more than half. I remember when you were kind of, uh, I, we, we were catching up after college one day and I actually, I vividly remember you were talking about someone had a, a request or something, a concept. And you were like, listen, man, even if I don't know how to do it, I'll go learn how I'll tell them I know how and I'll go learn how to do it. Um, yep. I think some people get intimidated by like being asked to do something they can't do. They don't think they can teach themselves. How important was that for you when someone's like, John, we want this, this, and this. And you're like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like, oh, we need like a drone operated. Can you do that? I'm like, yes. And then you go home and thank God for YouTube and you just learn everything you need to learn. And um, I'm very impatient. So it like drives me to like learn everything and I also like I would say like jealous or envious but like I see people doing things I'm like I want to do that I'm going to take that guy's job so I'll learn what he's doing I'll learn what the guy behind him is doing um it, it it's just like it's also like a hunger thing it's like if you want the job you have to be multifaceted so as soon as you hear that like oh they need this plus this plus this I'm gonna say yes I can do it and then start the the ticker like mm -hmm. clock and go hit YouTube or hit the computer and learn it as best yeah. as you can. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's what the journey of this podcast has been is, is we're kind of learning as we go. I mean, there were yeah. a couple, I think some of our best podcasts starting out were not recorded because we forget to hit, we forgot to hit the red button. So. <laughs> oh, I've done that. I've done that too. I've done a whole shoot where I realized audio is not going. And then I'm like, can just, just, just for safety, can I get you say all that again, but like in a five second condensed version? And then like, that's the version I use. And I'm like, yeah, yeah this was your best take. Yeah, <laughs> go with the flow, break stuff. And as long as you can forgive yourself, like mm -hmm. as long as you forgive yourself and, and look at every mistake as, an, as a learning opportunity and your, your clients or your stakeholders aren't too precious about it, like you'll be all right. It's all, yeah. it's all about rolling with it. What was the first, um, I guess, like gig or the first uh, shoot you went with that kind of was like, oh, I, I can do this. Because I think like a lot of our listeners, they have their side hustles. They have the thing that they're kind of dabbling with. It's a hobby, but not quite a business. And it's not a business because they say, oh, how can I make money doing this? We know a lot of people that, I mean, I'll, I'll be, it's safe to say 99% of the people listening to this podcast have a camera. It's on their smartphone. You know, mm -hmm. maybe a select few have a DSLR camera or, you know, a beefed up camera that they, they can take pictures with, but it's nothing more than a hobby. What was that first yeah. glimpse where you're just like, Ooh, I can do this. Yeah. Well, for the people who think that they can't do stuff because of what they're limited by what they have, like I say, just embrace what you have and work with what you have and make it the best it could ever be. Um, because I think it's like, if you are the type of person that says, if they just gave me the money, I could do something great rather than 
do something great with as much as you have and then let people say like, wow, imagine if we invested a little bit more, how much more amazing it would be. Um, for me, my first gig, so, so I decided to stay in LA. I was working a day job at like a website doing like customer service. I was interning slash like, I had like a mentor that was kind of like teaching me everything about cameras and editing and pretty much how to use the Adobe suite to make anything and everything. Um, and then I was working at a bar at night. So needless to say, oh, and I was working for a nonprofit organization also that was subsidizing my rent. So four jobs here right now. I'm doing four jobs, right? Two of which is part-time, one of which is like as much as I possibly can to learn stuff. Plus he's taking me on some gigs. And then I'm also doing um, like a full-time day job. So the benefit was is that the nonprofit paid for my living situation. The full-time job kept money in my pocket. And then the other one was teaching me things. And then the bar was like pretty much giving me a social life because I didn't know anyone here. Mm -hmm. um, that gave me the opportunity to kind of take on jobs and take on opportunities to learn stuff for free. Like people would say, Hey, I could bring you on this gig. I can't pay you anything, but like, you can see what's going on. You can like learn stuff. So I put, set myself up in a way that like my living costs were pretty low. I had some income coming in and whatever free time I had left on the weekends, I was learning. Um, I was building up a small amount of work, just like following people around with cameras and stuff like that. And then through that, I got hit up by one of my very, very close good friends from high school who was working at Condé Nast for the time and asked me to work um, a Teen Vogue cover shoot with Selena Gomez hmm. um, doing behind the scenes. She's like, you're just there documenting the day. And that was my first time like on a real, real photo set working with like John Paulo Segura, one of like the biggest, best photographers of all time. And um, everything kind of just like clicked for me. I was like, this is it. This is so cool. This is amazing. Here I am. I'm on set. I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'm going to figure it out. And the day went well enough that I got called back to do more behind the scenes shoots with Teen Vogue. So I worked with like um, Ariana Grande and, Katy Perry and just like all these big stars. And those were my first real jobs as well as my first real learning opportunities being on set because you can learn so much about using a camera, but there's certain things that you don't know until you're there on the day, like how to interact with the models, how to interact with your clients and, and all those kind of things. So though that was like a major, major thing for me was uh, shooting behind the scenes for Teen Vogue cover shoots was uh, my first jobs and my first real experience. And that, that's awesome because there, there's a lot of things I want our listeners to take away from that story yeah. because when you have four jobs, um, a lot of people, they'll have like their hobbies and they'll have, they have things that don't connect and they have things that they have no intention behind them. So it's not like you were just working four jobs. You were strategic where you're like, okay, one job is paying my bills. Another job is actually giving me a social life because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so busy. I don't have time to go out and party. And <laughs> I know LA is probably very people, expensive. <laughs> and the people working at the bars and the bar scene, you'll realize are people in the same, were at the time, same position as me. It's like actors, models, musicians who are moving here and like, a lot of those people that I worked with were the same people. I'm like, let's go test shoot like after work in the alleyway. Let's do a test thing this weekend. And setting yourself up to network is like super important, just as important. Yeah. So like this was something that I feel like it was a 24 seven thing for you where you're like, okay, I'm out in LA. Um, it's sure. might've been through the summer, but you're like, this isn't a summer vacation if you're working for jobs. No, no. And I made the decision to stay at the end of the summer. So that's really, it's, it was like September and I just, I just started picking up as much work as I could. And, you know, there were some days where, you know, there was a job or an opportunity to go to a shoot or something. And I would just take off the day job that I hated and eventually I started taking off so many days because other stuff was picking up that I got fired. And my boss, um, who's a great guy and a really talented photographer as well. Um, and this was like a tech startup. He pretty much brings me in and he's like, listen, man, I, I know what you're doing. I'm going to do you a favor and fire you because you suck at this job. 
and you need to just go like chase your dreams and like do your thing. And fast forward eight years later, um, last year I was at Coachella with a band called Dreams as like their personal photographer, like tour photographer. And I'm in the photo pit at Coachella shooting this band and I look over and there's my old boss who used to shoot photos on the side also. And I see him and he didn't even recognize me. I'm like, hey man, what's up? You remember firing me like eight years ago? And his face, like, he's like, yes. And we like hugged and it was, it was an awesome full circle experience. Yeah. And that's amazing yeah. because I mean, your boss, your, your previous boss, he probably did you, like he said, I'm doing you a favor. I'm going to fire you. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah. I love that you guys come, come back. And I think that says a lot about people out in LA. It says a lot about someone on a, a startup to fire an employee because it's best for them you know and can actually and i sucked (laughs) (laughs) i sucked at my job i was terrible it was like email customer service for like Mm -hmm. like a reward social rewards website it was he's like you suck i'm gonna do you a big favor (laughs) well i think there's a lesson in that too because a lot of us look at the job that we're working it's like we're so bad at our job how could we be good at something else it's like well if you don't like what you're doing you're probably not gonna be that great at it and and it is what it is Back to the, you're doing these shoots. And so you're on the first big shoot that, that you, yeah. you're a part of. You're doing more and more of these behind the scenes shoots. You're on set. Um, I love you talked about the experience of being on set because we could read about soccer all we want, but unless we kick a soccer ball, we don't know how to play. So Unless you're on the field with like Ronaldo. I don't know. I'm not a sports person, but I know. Okay. Like Pele. Yeah. <laughs> unless you're like on the field and they're coming right at you, like that's when you're going to learn. You're like, yeah. Oh, it's all yeah. about the experience. Um, exactly. What were, I guess, what were the nerves like when, when you're doing these shoots and even further as your career's progressing, not just doing behind the scenes, but when you're the main photographer and you're actually starting to rank up, I guess, in, in the field, what were your nerves like? Did you ever feel like you were in over your head? Yeah. Um, I've been yelled at by famous people in front of large groups of people for doing the wrong thing or not being ready. And it rattles you. And like, I've definitely like something's not working and people are waiting and your whole body goes into shock. And I've like been like in within a matter of five seconds of something not turning on, I imagine myself like moving home back to my parents' house into their basement and like, starting over and like I'm just like this what am I doing here I'm over my head um yeah so so jobs started to get bigger my portfolio got bigger doing behind the scenes stuff and then I started getting hired to do my own shoots where I'm the photographer and there's like a behind the scenes guy behind me and you know clients started getting bigger and talents started getting bigger and um I would definitely go into shoots super nervous depending who it was. Um, but within a few seconds, like as long as you're prepared, that goes away. Um, I, I told this story recently on, a, on another podcast, but I worked my biggest shoot I think I ever did where I was the photographer was shooting Khloe Kardashian for a sunglasses ad. And it was just me and her. Like I'm the photographer, she's the model. We have a set for the whole day. And it was just like us making making photos. and going into it, I put so much pressure on myself. Like, you know, she's got 50 billion followers and this is going to make or break my whole career if these don't come out good. And I had, I, I need to do something ambitious and big and, and blah, blah, blah. And, and within five minutes of the first look, I just was like, dude, be yourself, do what you know how to do, just relax. And um, I fell back into myself and that shoe came out great. And I was super happy with it. And then I always took from that, like, trust yourself, feel comfortable. And as long as you're prepared, just like rely on, rely on your like confidence and, and trust yourself that you prepared yourself and just like do what you know. Yeah. And I mean, and that's the thing I feel like when, when you're prepared and you've done everything you possibly can um, at some point in time, you just got to chalk it up to like, Hey, I'm ready for this, you know? And, and yeah. I think a lot of us, I love that. You're like, if something's broken within five seconds, I'm, I'm on my parents' couch or in the basement. Yeah. Like this, it's like, Hey John, what happened? I didn't bring a memory card. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. 
I was on a shoot for Golf Digest once. We shot two whole days worth of stuff or like one full day's worth of stuff around the second day. And I remember I was like, oh, let me see how much like memory I have left on my card. And as I'm like, don't delete the card, don't format the card. And I just deleted everything on it, like in my head. And I was just like, well, it was a good ride, LA. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It ended up not being a big deal. Like we worked with, I was just like, sorry guys. Like, I don't know. My, my brain just malfunctioned and, and it was okay. Like, yeah, it was okay. But I, I yeah. love that. Cause you said it earlier, like we got to forgive ourselves. Cause I've done a, a promo shoot for Fox and, or we did like, it was like this whole segment where we had a family and we surprised them with like tickets and like, you know, you have like that, that, moment where you have like three cameras rolling because you got to catch that moment <laughs> and then like so we did it and then the main camera the guy like goes to check the footage same same as you and he just goes oh, i formatted it like it's all gone like it's it's yeah. all gone <laughs> yeah. and, and your heart he, drops yeah because like you can't recreate the moment <laughs> but thankfully we, we had the backups the the other photographers had it and stuff like that so um, I, I think that's, we tend to make a situation so much bigger than it is in our heads and, and we freak out and we start going into a spiral or a tunnel of like, oh, this is, this is it. This is where it ends. Yeah. This is so, the end of the world. But yeah. if you do so, it enough times, you realize you're okay. Right. <laughs> Just don't have another brain fart. <laughs> right. Talk Not about um, the documentaries you shot. I remember you texting me one day like, bro, I'm going to Haiti. I've been to Haiti three times now, actually. Um, You've been to Haiti more than me. And I've been to places in Haiti that people do not go, people like me do not go to. I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah. um, I talk like every time I've like talked to anyone from Haiti where I, you know, I could tell and I'm like, are you from Haiti? And they're like, yeah, I'm from Haiti. I'm like, I've been to Haiti. They're like, oh, Port-au-Prince. I'm like, nah, nah. <laughs> I've been to like Guanamanth. I've been to Carpechan. I've been to Fort Liberté. And they're just like, what were you doing there? Yeah. Um, <laughs> My dad's probably listening right now, calling me like, what was John doing there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and so going back, like I mentioned that I had a mentor, like one of the few jobs that I had was like working alongside a, a good friend of mine who's to this day still one of my best friends. And it was me, him and another guy who kind of all linked up. They were already working together on just projects. Like, like I said before, concept to content. That was their mission using just a 5d canon 5d dslr camera and the adobe suite and between um keynote illustrator photoshop and premiere editing they could build websites videos for the websites all the photos he can help like he was just helping people and working on really really random projects so as my skills started to get better and their work started to get bigger and we had more stuff and I got fired. The three of us kind of like officially started our own business. It was the three of us. And for the next eight years or so, we ran this business with, I think at our most, we had 15 employees and an office in downtown LA. We were doing all kinds of branded like content, web series kind of stuff, um, behind the scenes things, like all kinds of stuff. And we were approached through a friend of a friend who worked at UCLA Medical Center about doing some branding work for a nonprofit organization called HRFU, Hernia, Hernia Repair for the Underserved. Started with just building out a website and some photos and videos or whatever. And then it turned into like, how would you guys like to come on the trips? Um, they're a nonprofit that travels around the world to different parts of the world helping with very specific medical problems. So the first round was like, we're gonna go to Haiti four or five years in a row for about two weeks at a time. And we're just gonna train Haitian surgeons how to fix hernias. And that's it. And after five years, we'll have enough uh, surgeons trained that we don't ever need to go back. And we wanted to know how we could continue to help and work with these guys. So we ended up going along to create media that was used for partnerships with medical supply companies. So they were getting a lot of items donated. What can we do for the companies that are sending those items? We can create little commercials for them or little pieces of content of their product on the shelf, saving people. We also created um, media to be used for fundraising because they are a nonprofit organization. So at their galas, they can show this is what we've been doing. 
What we also did was we went to film the surgeries to leave behind as training videos for the Haitian surgeons. So we kind of helped formulate like, how can we be involved and how can we help in all aspects? How can we help with funding? How can we help with partnerships? How can we help on their end? And, and pretty much being multifaceted, like you need to be a photographer, a shooter, like a cinematographer, an editor, a strategist. So we pitched this whole thing and they were down and we got to go to Haiti with them three years in a row, um, traveling all across the country and keeping all those things in mind every day, like product, uh, nonprofit fundraising and leave behinds to help the program. And ended up doing that after the Haiti trip, I ended up doing that for a few other companies um, and ended up going to like uh, Uganda, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, and working on all kinds of projects, um, like using this model with other companies uh, to start doing these trips. So I was splitting my time between like fashion shoots in Los Angeles and then like documentary shoots in Uganda mm -hmm. and splitting my time between those two things and getting so much influence and so much experience and using them in their, you know, shooting kids in Uganda, like I was shooting models in LA and shooting commercials in LA, like I was shooting a documentary in Haiti and crossing all these different um, styles and influences. And it, it, it turned into like a really incredible bunch of years uh, doing that kind of work. What do you think's the, the secret juice or I wouldn't even say secret juice, but what do you think is, I guess that umph that takes it from just a few guys to having a number of employees and office in downtown LA working on these projects. And cause you're talking about the versatility of, like you mentioned, filming a documentary and also filming a fashion show and having, yeah. having the ability to adapt to each environment or even like you mentioned, pull the best of the opposite environment into the other one and a, and apply it to what you're doing. Yeah. What do you think is, I guess, that juice or that umph that takes you from just a bunch of guys with a camera and some editing software to mm -hmm. working with these big brands? Uh, I say first is unless you are like Steven Spielberg, do not be precious about your work. Like until you are the top top of your of the food chain of whatever industry you are in. Do not be precious. Do not claim like, oh, I'm an artist, artist integrity. Sure, to a degree, but you are working for someone else. You please that client at any, whatever it takes. And we've stayed up three days straight trying to get an edit out on time. We've finished things and in the last hour, they decide they don't want it and we will do everything it takes to, to scrap it and get something that they want. What took us to the next level, I think, was being scrappy AF, like whatever it takes, we will figure it out, even if it's like hacking things together, stealing things off the internet and changing it around, really knowing your software so you could like hack things together. And um, yeah, I would say just doing, doing whatever it takes, staying up all night, saying yes to everything, saying whatever needs to be said to make your client feel like you are there and you have their back. Nice. So yeah. there's a guy named Frank that's listening to this podcast right now. They have a camera. They've dabbled with pictures. Um, they're probably even taking a picture a day for 2020. Yeah. Um, nice. And they want to they wanna make it more than just a hobby. Um, what would you tell, tell Frank or anyone listening to start doing? Uh, invest in yourself. Um, the, if, if your goal is to get hired by let's say a magazine let's say your goal is i want to shoot the cover of vogue magazine what are you doing to get there what are you doing to impress like who hires the person to hire who hires the person to shoot the cover of vogue what are you doing to impress that person so let's say you're a photographer and you're shooting headshots right now that's all you're getting headshots okay that's great practice headshots, master it, be the best headshot shooter in the whole world. And I'm not knocking headshots, but like, if that's what you're doing, because that's all you can get right now, great. Whatever you're charging, take as much money as you can. I mean, if this is paying your bills right now, like obviously pay your bills, but you need to be setting aside money every week, every month, whatever you can, put it into your Vogue cover sheet fund. 
And whenever you have enough to hire a model and to hire, and I'm, I'm saying hire, don't ask for favors on these. Hire the right model, hire the right hair and makeup, find the right location, build your creative brief the way that Vogue wants it done. Look online and there's plenty of examples of like, what does your pitch deck look like or your creative brief look like? And, and fund and produce your own shoot. And do that as many times as you can over the span of a year or two years. So for every three headshots you do, every th three headshot sessions you do, do one Vogue cover shoot. And you will start building a portfolio of Vogue cover shoots. And then when people say, what do you want to do? And you say, I want to cover the shoot of Vogue. You're not showing them headshots. You're showing them highly, con like highly conceptual um, photo shoots that came out of your brain, not uh, some other creative directors, not someone breathing down your neck, like on a hired gig. These are purely yours. And after enough of those, you'll develop your voice and your style. And that's what people are going to hire you for. They say, have you seen what this guy or this girl can do? They are amazing. I love their style. Let's hire them to do that on our thing. And I think that's the goal is to eventually be hired for what you can do, not what you can emulate or what you're being hired for. What is the burning thing that comes out of your creative soul? Build up a portfolio of that and put it on display. And people will either love it or hate it, but they'll hire you for it if they love it. Oh, yeah, man, dude. I, I think, and I, I'm not trying to attack any of the listeners, but mm -hmm. what your advice right there, it's, it's putting the ego away. It's literally because there's a lot of people who are like, oh, well, I, I need to get paid for my work. I need to get paid for what I'm doing. You know, before I even step foot in a TV studio, remember those little flip cameras that had a little USB that pops out on top and you plug it in? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I went around covering hurricanes with a little flip cam, like, like a little flip cam on Long Island and say, oh, we got this and this tree's about to fall. And, and it was it was all for free. I would forecast yeah. before work. I was working a full-time job, but I did it all for free. But eventually a TV station saw what I did and then gave me a shot. So I think yeah. a lot of people, they, they don't jump into the creative side because they want to get paid for it, but you can't develop your creative, I guess, your creative eye or voice without actually working on it. Really yeah. quick, because we're I mean, coming towards the end. Um, sure. I want to talk about the gap. Um, the gap of you might have the greatest taste in the world. And you're like, listen, I know good music or I know good photography, but when yep. you're doing it, it doesn't look the way you want. And I think a lot of people get discouraged from that gap. <laughs> how yeah. do you close that gap and how do you deal with it? Yeah. So this is a really wonderful quote that I share a lot. It's from Ira Glass, who does This American Life. And he talks about the gap and he says, the only way to close the gap between what you know is good and what you're making is to just do it over and over and over and over again. Um, if you love, if you know what a really good steak tastes like and you've never cooked in your life, the first steak you ever make most likely is going to suck. And you know, it's going to suck because you're going to take a bite out of it. And you're going to go, this tastes like shit. And I know what good steak tastes like. And every single time you cook it, you're going to get a little bit better, a little bit better. You're going to learn what you did wrong and whatever until it finally get, you know, you cooked 600 steaks and finally, that 601st oh, chef's kiss, you're like, this is it. It tastes perfect. It's the right, around, right amount of salt, right amount of pepper, right amount of resting time. I finally nailed it. This is good. I'm proud of it. I will share this with the world. So just keep cooking. Just keep cooking. All right. Just keep cooking. <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> um, I want to talk about the la last question before we wrap things up. Sure. Um, the rainbows you're chasing now. Um, obviously, yeah. you know, you, your, your company's grown, had the uh, office in downtown LA. That has since kind of shifted and, and you're continuing to, to grow. Um, so so what's, what's the, the future look like now for John Shore? Um, yeah, so our business closed uh, in a good way because uh, – we were doing client work for the Walt Disney company, quite a bit of it um, over three years of time, started with one group, started to build, build. And then eventually my whole team went full time at Disney. So that was really great thing for us. So now I'm there full time. And um, we, within our group, we have a whole 
ton of missions, you know, within, within the company, we have stuff that we want to achieve, but on a bigger scale for me personally, um, I'm recording a ton of music myself right now. Um, I've written a short, like a film that I want to direct and shoot myself and then use all the music that I'm writing to score the movie. Um, I'm still shooting uh, friends and family and people as much as I can on the weekends. So I feel like, I don't know, for the first time in 10 years, I'm a little bit of a, like a, is it a plateau when, when your curve straightens out for a little bit? I'd say I'm at a plateau for the first time in a while and I'm actually kind of taking a breather um, and finding out what like my new voice is, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. I was saying like, find your voice. Um, I think for 10 years, I hustled really, really hard and my voice was a little bit shifty to be what it had to be. And now that I'm at this plateau, I'm kind of taking a step back, looking at all the work I've done over the last 10 years that got me here and trying to focus maybe more on like, instead of a hundred things, maybe just like 20 things and do them really, really good rather than a hundred things like so-so. Yeah. Working on your way of, of becoming an expert or, I mean, you're already the Renaissance man in my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> thanks teddy yeah, yeah yeah thanks <laughs> so where can folks reach out see more of your work and the things that you're working on see some of your portfolio and the pictures and that you that you've done stuff like that man um oh you're saying like where can they see it oh yeah or what yeah uh on my website is jonathan com. my last name is looks like shoe with an r at the end mm -hmm. um also my instagram and twitter is just at johnny shower so nice. you can go see what i'm doing and uh, I'm going to be putting out, I've been doing a quarantine project over the last like couple of months. I've been out shooting like empty streets and I've been doing like portraits of my friends through their windows and stuff. So I'll be putting that stuff out in the next few weeks. Nice. Well, I'm looking forward to that, man. I'll have those in the show notes. And I got to say, we've come a long way since our song Folliculitis in, in Folliculitis. <laughs> I, I just want to say f for your listeners, um, Teddy Phaeton was, I remember meeting you freshman year and asking you like, what's your major? What do you want to do? And you said, meteorology, I'm going to be a weatherman. And for the next four, like four years, we'd be maybe a little inebriated at, at parties and stuff. And I'd be like, well, what's your major again? Meteorology. I'm going to yeah. be the weatherman <laughs> year after year. And then you get out and there you are on TV telling people the weather. And I tell people the story all the time. Like I know one person who went in with a mission, stuck to it, got out and is thriving in it. So I just want to say congrats to you. And it's been a pleasure to watch like all your success and everything. And you're doing amazing. And I love you. Hey, I love you too, man. I appreciate it. And I, I've loved seeing your story progress. And what excites me the most is um, I feel like we're all, we're both still very early in our stories and where we're going. And I just can't mm -hmm. wait till um, our careers and our paths merge us together once again. And um, we can collaborate for a better, uh, a better song than just to fill the listeners in on a little inside joke of folliculitis. We wrote a song in our in the college dorm, <laughs> dedicated. I to had an, an I had an infected hair follicle in my nose, and my nose blew up like three times the size of it already is. And then we wrote a whole rap song called folliculitis about it, and it was a hit. It was a banger. Yeah, yeah. It's like top <laughs> top stream song. <laughs> SUNY Albany for the year, right? <laughs> for sure. Shout out SUNY Albany. Man, John, thank you so much. Um, I know there's a bit of a time difference, but I appreciate you taking the time this morning, afternoon, whatever time it is over by you. Um, yeah. I'm going to have to make it out your way and, and see you and, um, and see what you're working on, man. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. Well, thanks for being on to the listeners. Thank you for making it to the end. Just recapping some of the bombs that John dropped during the episode. First and foremost, when you change your environment around people who are actually doing things, you realize that it's possible. Whatever dream you might have is actually possible. And you want to learn everything that you need to learn. Whatever your goal might be, whether it's a podcast, photography, videography, maybe you're trying to start that business. Just learn everything you need to learn and forgive yourself along the way. And I love when uh, you said embrace what you have. A lot of times we think, oh, if we just had the professional equipment, if we just had that top-notch equipment, we'd be able to, to play with the big dogs. It's not the case. And as a matter of fact, while doing this, this, uh, this podcast, I always did in-person interviews and I didn't do Zoom. Well, now all the major podcasts that I watch, they're all doing Zoom. 
and I and we're all on a level playing field. So it doesn't matter the equipment you have as long as you make the best out of what you have. And of course, as long as you're prepared, learn to trust yourself. Just some of the tidbits that we dropped during this episode. John, man, thanks again. Thank you. All right, fellas, as we always say at the end of the episode, everybody wants the sunshine, but they don't want the rain, but you can't have the pleasure without a little pain. Let's grow. The No Rain, No Rainbows podcast is recorded at Camaraderie, a collective workspace in Greenville, South Carolina, right off the Swamp Rabbit Trail. If you're looking for a place to grow your business, network with other professionals, and establish your own workspace, Camaraderie is the place to do so.